Uh, and this is work that I started uh, when I joined NYU in 2011. Uh, and I should also mention that this is not just my work. It's actually mostly work by many other people uh, that I work with at the Visualization, Image, and Data Analysis Center at NYU. Right? So let me start by uh, talking about uh, urban data and why this is important. Right? I don't need to convince you, you're in Chicago, uh, that cities are the center of economic activity. And uh, we've seen this great phenomenon where uh, the world is getting urbanized. Over 50% of the world population today lives in cities, and this number is later to grow to 70% uh, by 2050. Right? But as we all, uh, people that live in big cities know, this growth uh, leads to several problems and challenges regarding transportation, traffic, uh, environment, pollution, uh, uh, cost of housing, and aging infrastructure. However, there's some good news in the sense that uh, in the recent past, uh, there's, there, there have been great efforts to collect data about cities. And a lot of these data are not only being collected, but being, available, being made available by many cities around the world. Right? And these data are collected about the different components of urban environments, uh, the people, the environment, and infrastructure, both physical and policy. Right? And one way to think about cities is like cities are like computer programs, right? And have all these different components that interact in complex ways. And uh, the idea here is that because these components generate a massive data exhaust, we have now the opportunity to use this data exhaust to understand the rules that govern this city or the, this urban program. Right? And by understanding these rules uh, and analyzing this data exhaust, we can better have a better idea of how these uh, urban components interact over space and time. And we can use these insights to make cities more efficient, sustainable, and ultimately improve the lives of uh, the urban residents. Right? And uh, this is not, you know, uh, there's al al already a lot of evidence that this can actually be done, and uh, we can find a number of success stories. And I'll go over a few of these. Uh, one early example where urban data was used was for uh, real-time bus arrival predictions. And this was work that was pioneered at the University of Washington, where they used both real-time data and historical data to uh, <coughs> Uh, provide accurate predictions so you could look at your uh, cell phone and see uh, when your bus is going to arrive, right? And this led to a great improvement uh, in uh, satisfaction of uh, the bus users in Seattle, right? Uh, and uh, there are also other unintended uh, health effects where people knew that the bus was going to arrive in five minutes, so they walked a few more blocks to get to the next stop, right? But this was a, you know, such a great success that we've seen such apps being actually adopted in many other cities. Right? So this is a good example where you know, uh, urban data was used to directly benefit city residents. Uh, another example from New York City was this uh, case of um, uh, this effort led by Mike Flowers, who was the data, scientist, uh, data science czar under Mayor Bloomberg. And one problem that they tackled was illegal conversions. Do you guys know what illegal conversions is? So the big cities, housing is very expensive, right? The square foot is very expensive. So what often people do is they get a small space and they create many more dwellings than it's actually safe. And when they do that, they make like a bad electricity connections. There's no plumbing and, you know, it's no good living conditions. And these lead to several problems, uh, in particular fires. Uh, they, they, uh, they're, they're a major cause of fires in, in New York City. And one problem uh, that the city faced is that there are about 25,000 uh, illegal conversions complaints in New York City, but uh, they only have 200 inspectors. Right? So that's a big problem. They cannot investigate all the different complaints. 
So what Mike Flowers and his team did is that they obtained data from 19 different agencies in New York City. And they looked for data that provided indications about you know, the health of the buildings, like in, uh, insect infestation or number of uh, uh, ambulance visits or late mortgage and so on and so forth. They integrated those data uh, and uh, crossed with fire uh, information about fire and created a regression model. And now when they receive new complaints, they apply this model and they predict you know, how likely it is that that building has a real uh, uh, illegal conversion problem, <coughs> right? And this you know, led to um, you know, a huge improvement in the heat rate for the inspections that went from 13% to 70%, right? And this is a great example where you can use data to make cities more efficient and indirectly benefit residents. And last but not least, you know, there's also a number of examples where these data, uh, urban data, has been used to uh, make policies that, uh, uh, like for example, in, in, in at NYU, there's the um, uh, Urban uh, Furman Center uh, for Real Estate and Policy. And this group, they have a long history of doing data-driven policy. And here are just you know, a few examples of uh, studies that they did uh, in this case. Um, uh, where they found that concentrated foreclosures uh, uh, lead to an uptick in c crime. And because of this study, actually NYPD changed its policing uh, strategy, right? And uh, you know, there's a good example of how urban data can impact policy, right? So while there are uh, a number of these you know, success stories, I still think that, that they are very, uh, they are far, few and far in between, right? And uh, you know, they're great stories, but all of these efforts required a lot of work, right? And uh, they, they were all like one-off kind of solutions, and it's very hard to scale. And uh, the question is, why is this the case, right? And uh, this is the case because exploring urban data is very difficult. Uh, it's difficult because it, uh, substantial effort is required uh, and resources are required to actually extract insights from data, right? You have to deal with lots of data that come from many different sources, different formats. Uh, they have different levels of reliability, and they're very difficult to integrate. I mean, Mike Flowers, it took them, I think, over six months just to integrate the data from these 19 different agencies, right? Uh, on top of that, even when you have the data, you know, in order to extract insights, you need to create these complex computational processes. And to do so, you require expertise in a number of, of methods in a number of different areas, including data cleaning, data management, integration, uh, visualization, uh, modeling, statistics, machine learning, right? Uh, and this is hard even for us that are computer scientists. It can be even harder for domain experts that don't have training in computing. Right? And what this leads is that you know, domain experts usually have to rely on data scientists to do this kind of analysis. And this, uh, you know, makes, uh, this distance uh, forces them to be distant from the data that they actually understand. Uh, and it also forces uh, these analysis to be mostly confirmatory. Right? And that uh, really hampers the ability of the domain experts to actually do exploration and hypothesis generation from the data. Uh, another challenge comes from the fact that when you're doing data exploration, uh, you have to go to this uh, you know, iterative process where you get some data, you perform some computation, and you generate some plots, get some results, you understand them, it's not quite what you're uh, you know, expecting, then you change your computation and you keep doing this uh, as you uh, formulate and uh, test your hypothesis. right? And uh, one challenge here is the fact that, you know, after many steps, uh, it's very easy to get lost and not remember exactly which steps you follow to get there. Uh, on top of that, many things can go wrong, right? You know, processes may break, even, you know, behind your back, things in the installation of your system may change. Uh, and when you get the result, it can be really hard to understand and interpret what you obtain, and the question is, can you trust those, right? So you can be wrong, the system can be wrong, the <laughs> computations can be wrong, right? So this path from data to knowledge is very tortuous, right? And uh, often now, decisions are based on the results of these analysis. 
And uh, if you derive incorrect results, that can lead to uh, bad decisions that can have very serious conf consequences. Right? Uh, so our vision uh, in terms of a research agenda is that, you know, yes, data have been democratized. You have data everywhere, right? But getting insights from that data is extremely hard. So how do we actually make it so that uh, data-intensive research and practice is actually widely adopted and applied by different stakeholders, governments, policymakers, social science researchers, and urban, and urban residents too, right? Uh, and here I see a huge opportunity to actually reach a large swath of people and a large fraction of the population that is uh, actually interested, invested, and able to participate in decision making about the cities where they live. Right? So the work that I've been doing over the past uh, eight to ten years um, has been to try and uh, deliver this vision by developing tools uh, and methods that empower these a wide range of stakeholders to obtain trustworthy and actionable insights from data. And doing this by uh, uh, attempting to significantly increase uh, the automation interactivity and, and scalability and usability for all the different tasks that are needed to go from data to insights, from data discovery, integration, exploration, modeling, and explanation. And in our work, uh, we actually uh, try to solve real problems. And to do so, we need to combine techniques from different disciplines, you know, visualization, data management, machine learning, you name it, right? And we also, uh, because we're trying to solve real problems, most of our projects are actually uh, interdisciplinary collaborations with domain experts that you know, go beyond computer science. Uh, and our work has led to papers, but also to a number of open source and deployed systems. So just to give you an idea, and uh, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about a few of these uh, projects. But to give you an idea, we have the Visualization Image and Data Analysis Center at NYU, where uh, we carry out a number of different uh, 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 research projects around urban data analysis and analytics. Uh, as I said, we have ongoing collaborations with social scientists, architects, city agencies. Uh, our works go from you know, developing methods and systems to actually deploying these systems with uh, domain experts. And uh, we are very fortunate to have in our group uh, a number of uh, people from different areas of computer science. Uh, that actually enables us to address you know, many problems in the different stages of the data life cycle, from uh, you know, data ingestion, data cleaning, to you know, core data management to make queries fast, to doing uh, you know, data mining and data analysis. Okay? So let me start by showing you one of the systems that we actually uh, developed in collaboration with uh, architects from KPF, which is a large architecture firm in, in New York City, just to give you an idea. So this one has uh, audio. Urbane allows users to seamlessly explore the city based on multiple 2D and 3D data layers. For example, noise, crime, and is visualized here, subway access. The data can be explored at different resolutions, the city, neighborhoods, and buildings. The opacity of the 3D buildings can be controlled for better visualization of the data layers. Urbane uses a parallel coordinate chart that allows for easy and intuitive filtering of urban data sets. Here, we filter neighborhoods for various attributes such as subway access and noise. The bold blue line represents the average of all midtown neighborhoods. The bold red line is a user-selected neighborhood here at the financial district. Filtering of various attributes allows users to understand the characteristics of Manhattan neighborhoods. For example, the financial district and midtown are very similar across most attributes. At the neighborhood scale, the same filtering system is applied to individual buildings. Again, the blue line represents the Manhattan average. Here, we filter individual buildings for attributes such as built area, crime, and noise, identifying sites for potential development. Once specific sites have been identified, Urbane gives users the ability to replace existing buildings with new buildings, testing different tower sizes and program combinations for the maximum zoned floor area. The user can generate speculative buildings on many sites. Here we see a hotel with residential, an all-residential building, and an office with residential. 
Once buildings are generated, Urbane can compute derived 3D attributes from the data in buildings. This includes the view from buildings to selected landmarks, the impact of buildings on sky exposure at the street level, and the impact of the buildings on the views of the existing context. This analysis can be used to evaluate the trade-offs between the value of a new development and its impact on the character of the neighborhood. This can facilitate the design and development process between architects, developers, and city planners. Okay. So, so what is the power of Urbane, right? So one is that it's uh, usable. Architects can actually directly use the system to perform complex analysis that nowadays takes them weeks or months to do with the existing tools, right? And this usability is uh, attained through the ability for, uh, um, that, that they now have of uh, performing three-dimensional queries, right? Uh, and this is one of the challenges when you're developing these tools is uh, how can, what kinds of visual interfaces and interactions you design that, you know, make the system easy to use. And in Urbane, this is done by supporting these 3D queries, including view impact queries and sky exposure queries, right? But as you've seen, there also, uh, uh, the system also supports um, uh, visual two-dimensional queries that allows uh, the uh, architects to um, examine different indicators in the cities like crime, uh, closeness to uh, transportation, schools, and so on and so forth, right? Both by, you know, using these uh, heat maps as well as the parallel coordinate systems that you've seen in the video, right? Um, so this is great, uh, but then we have a challenge, right? Uh, and the challenge is that these queries can be ex very expensive. Um, and uh, there are studies which show that when you have like a slow response time, even a response time that is greater than 500 milliseconds can greatly hamper the user's ability to make observations, uh, do generalizations, and generate new hypotheses. Right? And as I've seen in, in urban, even though we're dealing with lots of data and all of New York City, you can actually do that uh, uh, in, interactively. Even in such an application where you know, each uh, uh, interaction here that the user has with the parallel coordinates or with the heat maps actually derives a very large number of queries to the backends. Right? And the challenge here in terms of attaining interactivity is that all these queries are what we call uh, spatial aggregation, right? So the heat maps here, what they're showing in this case is the density of taxi pickups at the different neighborhoods, right? So here I need to look at all neighborhoods of New York City and count the number of taxis inside those neighborhoods, right? So this is like one aggregation query. When you're dealing with the parallel coordinates, you actually have one such aggregation query for each vertical line because you're looking not only at taxis, but subways, sky exposure, schools, prices, and so on and so forth, right? So you have you know, a very large number of queries. And even though you saw that in Urbane this is really fast, um, if you actually use an existing relational database system, uh, these queries are extremely expensive, right? And this slide is mostly for the database experts in the audience, right? Uh, these queries are very expensive for a number of reasons, right? So let's look at just the example of the taxi data. You can have billions of points in the taxi data. There's like about 500,000 taxi trips a day in New York City, and I think this data has about five years of uh, uh, taxi data, right? Uh, you have a large number of neighborhoods, and the neighborhoods in New York City are complex polygons that often have uh, hundreds of vertices. To build that um, uh, uh, heat map that I showed before, uh, what you need to do in a database is you need to join the, the points for the taxi trips with these neighborhoods. And this is done by this uh, uh, spatial join, which has two different phases, a filtering and a refined phase. So the filtering phase, what it does is that it approximates the neighborhood polygon with a minimum bounding rectangle because that's the fastest way to actually access this index that you have over the neighborhoods, right? But this provides an approximation. As a second step, you need to do the refinement where you need to figure out which taxi trips actually are in the real query polygon, in the real neighborhood, right? And uh, the challenge here is the fact that these pointing polygon tasks are expensive. And here they're especially expensive because the complexity is actually proportional to the number of vertices in the polygon and there are many in neighborhood polygons. And the other one is that you just have too many points, 
right? So this can get very expensive. Uh, this problem is uh, uh, compounded by the fact that you know, database systems often, uh, to do aggregation, they have to materialize the results. So after you do the join, you need to materialize in order to do the aggregation or count the taxis inside the neighborhoods, right? So as a result, if you try to do this uh, query, evaluate this query in a relational, commercial relational database, it takes several minutes, right? And as you've seen, this would not be acceptable uh, for an application such as Urbane. So the, one of the uh, benefits of having an interdisciplinary group is that you have people that come from different backgrounds and that can have insights that you didn't think about. Yes? So quick question about the previous slide. Sure. So what is, what happens each time a user interacts and what can be pre-computed here? Like, uh, it, it feels like your taxi data is not changing, but which part of this query changes per user interaction? So, uh, so what happens is that there's been a lot of work to attain interactivity for these kinds of queries by doing pre-computation, yeah. right? The challenge here, or the limitation here, is the fact that uh, users can ask a wide range of queries. And if you have to pre-compute and store, it becomes uh, prohibitively expensive. So our attempt here is to uh, actually speed up the queries. Okay. So this is what I'm going to try to explain how we did it, right? So, uh, so then we have Harish Swami, he's a graphics guy, and he said, you know, this is very slow, but you know, why don't we look at this operation from a geometric perspective, right? Instead of looking at the data as tables, like in relational databases, you know, let's look at this as you know geometric operations. Uh, and the way that you can uh, you can frame this problem as uh, drawing points and polygons on the canvas, right? So you have your taxi, your input points, you have your neighborhood polygons, and what you'd like is you'd like to draw these in the canvas and figure out what is in the intersection, right? It's a very simple idea. Uh, but with the simple idea, uh, maps very well to these new graphics hardware, this uh, graphic processing unit, right? And uh, you're gonna see how this works. So the idea is that um, uh, if I'm trying to do the drawings for the taxis, I have my virtual canvas and my graphics uh, processing unit. And as I get points, I draw the points on the canvas. Uh, and I, uh, I keep the count of how many points I'm drawing in particular pixels, right? So here I have one, I have another point. Then I have another point in the previous pixel, so I increment that to two, and I keep doing that, right? Then I can draw my neighborhood polygon. Right? And the next operation in order to find which points lie within my polygon, I do what in, in graphics is called rasterization. Right? I try to figure out now, I now to fill up the ins inside of the polygon. As I do that, I keep incrementing the number of uh, 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 points that I have in those uh, pixels. So I have two, I have three, and I keep doing that. Right? So this is very simple, and it's a much easier way of doing that spatial aggregation join, right? And the benefits here are that you know all these operations are natively supported by the GPUs. They have been made really fast and efficient to support you know all the gaming and all the you know uh, other kinds of processing. Uh, now instead of having a join followed by an aggregation, we can do both at the same time, and we require no point in polygon tests, right? And as you're gonna see with the performance results, this makes a huge, huge difference. But before, let me add a few notes about uh, you know, this operation which we call raster join, right? So one limitation here is that, as, as you've seen here, uh, this is approximate, right? Because you know, there are some of the raster that kind of like falls outside uh, the polygon and some areas are not really colored. So rasterization actually adds uh, false positives and negatives, right? Uh, however, this error can be controlled by, um, by if we change the size of the pixels in our virtual canvas, right? So if you increase the resolution and we make these uh, pixels smaller, we're going to get you know, better coverage of the polygon, right? So with us, we actually introduced this algorithm called bounded raster joy, where uh, the application can actually specify the amount of uh, acceptable error. Uh, here, uh, in, in doing that, you know, by using the Hausdorff distance uh, between the actual polygon and the, poly, the approximate polygon that is derived by the rasterization, right? But we also developed, uh, um, uh, oh, and 
Another point that I should make in the slide is the fact that uh, for the applications that we've been looking at, like you know, these visual analytics systems, uh, the approximate version, even when you have uh, this error, say, uh, by 20 meters, uh, uh, is actually, you, know, you can notice visually, you cannot notice any different uh, in, the, in the results, right? So this approximation actually works for uh, a number of practical uses of this technique, right? Uh, but we also developed an accurate version of the raster join, right? Uh, which is, uh, you know, since uh, the only problems that we have in rasterization are in the boundaries, what we do is uh, we do the pointing polygon test just for the pixels that uh, happen in the boundary. And with that, we get some speed up, right? So here are the performance results. And I should point out that um, uh, we used here a, uh, the taxi data that has uh, a little bit over 880 uh, million taxi trips. Uh, and we ran all the experiments on a laptop, right? Laptop like the one that most of you have uh, with uh, 16 gigabytes of RAM and uh, uh, an NVIDIA card where we used only three gigabytes of, uh, uh, of the card, right? And uh, here are the performance results uh, as we increase the size of the input from 400 to 800 million. And I'd like to, you, know, you to focus on the uh, top line here, which is the, the uh, bounded uh, raster join. And you can see that uh, you know, the speed up uh, over the single CPU uh, implementation is actually significant. We have about, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it, 300 times uh, faster than the, the CPU implementation, right? Uh, and to give you a better idea in terms of time, um, you know, as this, the input size increases from 400 to 800, uh, you can actually execute the spatial aggregation for the 880 million uh, points over the 260 New York City neighborhoods in just 1.1 1 .1, uh, seconds, right? So you can get a, an amazing speed up, you know, very short response times, which enables uh, Urbane to actually support those uh, sub-second response times, right? Uh, and you know, if you do it accurate or um, uh, the extra accurate is, is slower, right? But if you want to have exact results, you could also use that, and it's about 100 times faster than the CPU implementation. Okay. Yes? Just a quick question. So this is like a, in, in the shader environment, like this is being done? It's so being like, done inside the GPU. No, uh, as, as, a, as a shader program, like as a graphics program, or as a general computation? It's program. done as a, gra it's, it's, it's peak backing on the graphics shaders and so on, right? Yeah. Okay. So another system, sorry. Yeah, so another system that uh, we developed is uh, this uh, taxi vis system, and I'll show like very quickly. And this one was like a very early work that we did back in 2013, but I'd like to quickly show that. And uh, this was in collaboration with the Taxi and Limousine Commission, where we ha try we're trying to help them explore data about uh, taxi data in New York City. Right, so we built this tool that allows them to study uh, the you know the data over space and time. Um, and as you can see, you can do that uh, interactively. So you have the blue points are the drop-offs, the red points are pickups, and you can select different time periods, different time uh, patterns. Uh, you can select regions, and you can here figure out you know, the taxi uh, pickups and drop-offs at different regions, uh, how many uh, trips happen from that region to that other region, uh, so that you can figure out, uh, you know, un better understand um, uh, movement patterns Right? Uh, and as you can see, you can do all of that, again, interactively and just through a visual interface. Um, and this is just like the taxi trajectories, so all the taxis that um, uh, had a pickup in that particular region. So let me just skip this and go uh, forward, right? So here, again, we achieve uh, usability through visual operations. So instead of um, uh, having users write these textual SQL queries, Everything can be specified through a visual interface. Another advantage that the domain experts really liked here is that it's, it was often the case that in order to study this data set, they would use like Oracle or something to select the data and then they would move to some statistical tool to visualize and analyze the data. And here they can do the queries and actually see the analytics 
in the same uh, environment so that they don't lose the spatial and temporal context. Right? And you know, with that, you can do analysis like you know, figure out mobility. Here I look comparing the trips from uh, uh, lower Manhattan to the two airports in different days, Sundays versus Mondays. And you can very easily see the difference in trip durations that on Sundays it's uh, much shorter than on Mondays, right? And you can see that here in blue, LaGuardia, it, it always takes less time to go to LaGuardia than to JFK. So you can very quickly get, you know, answer some interesting questions. Uh, so this is uh, a visualization that shows what happened in uh, Manhattan uh, when we had uh, Hurricane Sandy. So you can see that this was before Sandy. This is the heat map for the taxi pickups. Uh, when Sandy hit, city dies. Um, then, uh, you know, the life gets back quite uh, almost normal for uptown. You guys remember what happened? So there was a big failure in an uh, electricity generation plant. And uh, us that live in downtown, we had no electricity for about a week, right? So you can actually see that through the taxi data, right? So it's, uh, it was also interesting to see how you know, a particular data set like taxi can tell us a lot about what happens in the city. Right? Uh, but you know, just like uh, for Urbane, uh, one of the problems that we had is how do you support these interactive queries over this uh, spatial temporal data? And in this case, we developed a, uh, sorry, uh, a new indexing that leverages the GPUs uh, and is able to support these queries uh, you know, uh, very efficiently, and I'm not going to go into the details, but I'll show you the numbers, right? So for those that study from the trips from uh, Lower Manhattan to the different airports, it's a query like what is described in the in the top, and these queries have about 13,000 uh, results each, and here we're showing the times uh, attained by a commercial database, uh, open source database, and this is the implementation of our index on top of MongoDB. You can see that you know. In the other databases, the times to execute these queries go anywhere from like 400 seconds, uh, sorry, from 20 seconds in the commercial database to 500 seconds in uh, PostgreSQL, whereas using our index in MongoDB, we actually get sub-second response times. Okay. So the takeaway here, uh, or the takeaways here, are first and foremost, uh, you don't need big iron or big clusters to analyze big data. In many cases, like what I showed you, uh, you, you can actually do that from your own, using your own laptop, right? Uh, uh, you know, you can actually rely and leverage all the power that these new uh, um, graphics processors give you in order to do this. Uh, another uh, takeaway is that, you know, yes, we're able to get, you know, that amazing efficiency using GPUs, but Coding for GPUs is extremely challenging. It's very, very difficult. So this work has actually led us to develop uh, um, what we are calling a GPU-aware spatial algebra. And the idea here is that you know, while nowadays what we do is for every single query that we want to speed up, we have this specific implementation that leverages GPU. So the idea with this algebra is that we develop a series of uh, basic operations that you can mix and match to create you know, complex queries without, and then we, if we implement these uh, operations, right, you can actually build these uh, new uh, complex queries without having to code on the GPU, right? Uh, the third uh, takeaway is that, you know, yes, you can, attain usability, but that actually requires uh, techniques, to combine techniques from multiple areas. You need people that design the proper insightful visualizations, the HCI people that can uh, design the interactions, uh, computer graphics and database people that actually can make the queries interactive, right? Uh, and uh, here there is a not only a huge need, but also a, a great opportunity to connect research in visualization and data management, right? And well, you know, luckily we actually have seen both in the VIS community and the data management community that you know people are seeing this convergence. And I think that this is going to be really important, uh, you know, in order to solve these pressing problems that we have, not only in urban data but in data exploration in general. 
So in terms of impact, right? Uh, so uh, I'm actually uh, very happy with the impact that a lot of this work has had. For TaxiViz, you know, the paper has gotten a lot of citations so far. Uh, but even more, uh, the system was picked up and uh, deployed uh, by the Department of Transportation. Uh, we, uh, when we had the first uh, version of the system, we gave them a demo and they wrote, you know, we were truly blown away. Uh, and the first version only ran on Macs and they bought a bunch of Macs just to run the system. <laughs> uh, so that was like a real validation. I loved that. And then I, we got this nice letter from the assistant commissioner that said, um, the speed at which the tool permits us to work has saved us multiple hours of staff time and has dramatically improved the unit's outputs and capabilities, right? And apparently they're still using it. Uh, it's unfortunate to know that you know, it's hard to collaborate with the city and they never gave, gave us any funding so that we could improve it, but <laughs> it's still useful to them, that's fine, right? So in terms of Urbane, uh, what we see it as a, uh, uh, the vision for it is this uh, system that supports uh, both 2D and 3D analytics because cities are 3D. So it's important to consider the 3D environment. Uh, and so here's a, an example of a recent work where people are using the urban infrastructure to study shadows uh, in the city, right? You know, like, uh, and, and this is a, a, actually a very important problem. Um, and I'm going to skip through this. This uh, work was actually featured in the, the upshot uh, section of the New York Times. And there's been a, you know, a lot of interest as, after this came out. For example, people that are worried about the health of trees in New York City, right? Trees are dying. Why? And then, you know, one of the things that uh, contribute to the health of trees is how much sun they get, right? So anyway, so uh, I see, you know, this, this whole area of exploring 2D and 3D aspects of cities as a, a very rich area for work and um, opportunity for impact. Any questions so far? Okay. So, um, so the other problem that I wanted to talk about is that, you know, yes, data has been, data have been democratized. Lots of data out there, but uh, it's not all roses, right? So let's look at just one example, which is the taxi data. And here we have five years of data, and we did just very simple profiling uh, to see what's in that data that is my favorite data set in New York City, right? So uh, in 2010, uh, we can see some interesting uh, stats where you have trip durations that are over a thousand minutes, uh, distance 16 million miles, uh, fares of $93,000 and so on, right? That's pretty weird. Uh, it gets weirder uh, and uh, <laughs> something that is kind of goes against the laws of physics maybe, right? Um, there's also other interesting, if you just, you know, do the plot the pickups and drop-offs, right? You know, this is the very dense, this is Manhattan, but you also see a number of taxis in the rivers. Uh, <laughs> and I assure you there are no amphibious taxis in New York City, right? So there's lots of uh, data quality issues. Some of them are easy to see that, you know, there are problems. Some are more subtle, right? And the problem here is that I said, you know, you make decisions based on data and analysis, and if you have bad data, you do analysis or create models, you're going to get bad results, right? Uh, so here's a more subtle problem, potential problems in the data, right? So here's, I have the taxi data, six months of the taxi data, uh, and here I'm aggregating, I'm counting the number of trips per day in June through uh, December, right? And uh, can anybody tell me what is interesting in this plot? So to me, one of the things that was interesting is the regularity. So I have two years of data here, 2011, 2012, and the line's almost the same, right? So it's kind of like the beat of the city is there, right? But then you also have these outliers here, right? And the question is, you know, these big drops when you have, you know, almost zero trips uh, in, in, in particular days, right? And you might ask, you know, are these big drops data quality issues or is it the case that they correspond to real events? Storm. Right? Exactly. So if you uh, go ahead and you plot the wind speed, right, uh, and you're going to see that the days when you have unusually high wind speed 
correspond to the days where you have very low number of taxi trips, right? And you know, by looking at this plot, the question that we asked ourselves is, can we use data to explain data, right? And uh, you know, if we're able to explain some of these weird values, it uh, is likely to help us figure out whether that is a data quality issue or a real feature, right? So this is what motivated us to uh, develop this, uh, what we call data polygamy framework. And uh, it's not because I lived in Utah, okay? It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, because, you know, it actually, uh, the goal is to discover relationships across, between attributes in different data sets, right? And the idea here is that, you know, any particular attribute can be connected to multiple attributes uh, in other data sets. And uh, we, the goal is by discovering these relationships, we can actually attempt to guide users both to discover relevant data uh, as well as, you know, uh, explain uh, interesting features in data. And uh, we aim to do this by supporting this kind of queries. Given a data set, find me all other data sets that are related to D, right? And the applications here are, you know, identify potential quality issues, explain interesting features. Uh, and another application that we're working on right now is, can you actually discover new attributes that can improve predictive models, right? Um, so how do we go about you know, solving this problem, well, this relationship discovery? So first, what are the desiderata, right? We're dealing with urban data, and urban data, most of it is, uh, has both spatial and temporal co components to it, so we need to take space and time into account. Uh, and because of our motivating example, uh, we're really interested in uh, looking at atypical behavior, right? But what are the challenges? We have lots of data sets. Uh, NYC Open Data has over 1,900 data sets. Some data sets are long, some are very wide, like the weather data has over 200 attributes, right? Uh, taxi data, some data sets can be very large, like uh, taxi has 180 million trips per year. Uh, the different data sets come at different resolutions, both temporal and spatial. Uh, and you know, if you just comp you know, look at the di different potential relationships between all the attributes, right, you end up with a combinatorially large number of relationships to evaluate. Just to give you uh, an idea, if I consider a single uh, spatial temporal resolution using 300 data sets from NYC Open Data, there are about 2.4 million possible relationships. Right? So how should we uh, address this problem? How, should we, uh, how can we find meaningful relationships? So again, in an interdisciplinary group, uh, people have insights that you would not otherwise have because I don't know anything or I didn't know anything about computational topology, right? Uh, but you know, um, again, Harish said, um, his PhD is in computational topology. Why don't we actually model the data as a topological surface, as a time-varying a time scalar function, right? Where you have a data set, like for example, the taxi trips, the taxi density in this case here, uh, and we can, come, we can uh, create a scalar function that uh, takes all the taxi trips at a, po at a point in space and time, and we map it to a real value. Right? So this data set here you know, will look like something like you know, this uh, three-dimensional function. Right? Uh, and what are the advantages of doing this uh, modeling? First and foremost, before you start with a, a whole bunch of uh, very uh, disparate data sets, by modeling them as time-varying scalar functions, now all the data are uniform. Right? They all have the same representation. Uh, the other big advantage is that uh, the topological representation naturally captures these atypical features that we're interested in, right? Because when you look at the function, these atypical behavior are going to appear as the critical points uh, of this function, the peaks and the valleys, right? Uh, and then, you know, once we have these uh, scalar functions, we can say that two attributes in, or in two different data sets are related if they're salient features actually overlap in space and time, right? So how does this work? Uh, the pipeline is as follows. You first get all your data sets, uh, each attribute in each data set, um, and we map that as uh, time varying scalar functions. Uh, and you compute these functions for all possible uh, spatial temporal uh, 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 resolutions, right? So you can go from a hybrid uh, resolution to neighborhood and so on and so forth, right? 
then uh, you need to decide what is atypical. You, you have to set up a threshold, but again, computational topology comes to the rescue here. And there's this notion of topological persistence that uh, gives you uh, an idea of how important a particular peak or a particular um, uh, valley is, right? And uh, we can actually use persistence to automatically come up with these thresholds in a data-dependent way, but in a data-driven way that doesn't require user input, right? Uh, and, you know, we have details. I'm not going to go into it, otherwise I'm not going to run out of time. Um, so you can do that in a data-driven way and automatic, right? And um, the other advantage here of, um, uh, uh, you know, this computational topology techniques is that there are actually data structures that enable you to very efficiently identify uh, these features, these peaks and valleys at all different resolutions. Uh, it's called the merge tree index, and it's uh, fast to construct, only n, n log n. Uh, and to find the features, you can do that in an output sensitive way. So you cannot be more efficient than that. Uh, and finally, another benefit here is the fact that uh, unlike many techniques for uh, event detection, if you will, uh, in spatial temporal data, the, this actually finds events that have arbitrary shapes and temporal extent. Uh, in fact, I should point out that a similar idea was actually used to uh, develop a, a technique for automatically identifying spatial temporal events in, in, in large data. Okay, so once you have the salient features, uh, you know, how do you go about finding the relationships? And here, intuitively, it's really simple. You just kind of like do a join, a spatial temporal join uh, of the, the, the scalar functions for the different attributes, right? And when they coincide uh, peak with a peak, you have like a positive relationship. And it's analogous to correlation, right? Positive correlation or when you have a peak with a valley, uh, you have a negative relationship. Uh, but as I said, uh, you can have many, many different relationships. Lots of them make no sense. They can be simply coincidental. So you need to have a way of evaluating uh, these or measuring these relationships. And we define you know, two such measures. One is the score, which captures the nature of the relationship, how positively or negatively related they are, and the strength, right? And the strength is more like how often these different functions coincide. Uh, and to try and prune the relationships that might be coincidental, we actually extended uh, you know, this Monte Carlo procedure to um, uh, take space and time into account, right? To, uh, com to assess the statistical significance for these different relationships. Right? Again, I don't have time to go over the details, but the idea here is that instead of just like a blindly randomizing the data, you create, do like a toroidal shift so that you do the, the randomization in a controlled way that takes both the space and time uh, into account. Right? So we implemented this. Uh, so the next question is, does this work? Right? So we implemented this, uh, and here we use MapReduce, and the reason that we use MapReduce is that all these different operations that we need to apply from identifying the relationships to creating the scalar functions are embarrassingly parallel. So it lends itself very well to an implementation in MapReduce. We ran uh, these jobs on a, you know old cluster with 20 compute nodes with these you know somewhat slow processors, and we used two different collections of data sets for the experiments. A, a smaller data set, meaning that it like, has fewer data sets, but they're much bigger, which was data sets that we obtained directly from the New York City agencies. And then we also used 300 uh, data sets that we got from the NYC Open Data. So what did we find in our uh, experiments? The approach is actually you know, scalable, uh, doesn't take very long to process all these different uh, files, even in an old cluster. Um, the approach scales linearly with the number of nodes. So if you have more nodes or faster nodes, it's going to you know, uh, scale well. Uh, we can evaluate 10,000 relationships per minute, which is uh, you know, also good. Uh, and we also assess both the correctness and robustness of the methods, and the details are uh, in, in the paper. But I'd like to show you uh, on the qualitative side, right? Does it actually uncover real interesting and non-trivial relationships? Right? So one question, have you ever been in New York City when it's raining and tried to find a taxi, right? Uh, 
and it's very hard. Uh, so uh, you can try to answer that question using looking at you know you, you, you issuing this following query, find all the relationships between the taxi and weather data sets, right? Trying to find an explanation for why you cannot find taxis. And we do find a negative relationship between the number of taxis and average precipitation, meaning that if you have lots of precipitation, you, you, there are fewer taxis. Uh, and uh, this actually is consistent with the long-standing hypothesis that taxi drivers are target earners, meaning that when it rains, that's higher demand. They fill up their quota and they go home, right? Um, and uh, so we also found the system also derived this uh, other relationship, which is a, a strong positive relationship between precipitation and average fare, right? So this suggests that hypothesis is true. What was interesting is that uh, we found this paper from 2014 by Farber that refuted this hypothesis because he didn't find a correlation between drivers' earnings and rainfalls, right? And there are some reasons why that happened. He, first and foremost, he didn't look uh, at the amount of rainfall. So he considered rainfall as zero one, as a binary variable, right? And he also considered the entire period, even periods that have very sparse rainfall, right? And uh, those were equivalent to the ones where they have the higher uh, rainfall. So to me, this underscores the importance of uh, when you're trying to find relationships amongst data sets, Yes, you should look at correlation, you should look at all data set, but you should also uh, take into account these atypical behavior because they, it, they can uncover um, interesting insights that you cannot see if you look at the, whole, the data as a whole. Right? Um, so another example uh, that uh, we looked at was uh, this reduction of traffic speed and the number of accidents. And we did that because in New York City, they have implemented this, um, uh, uh, oh my God, now I forget the name, it's the um, Vision Zero, Vision Zero right? Uh, right? Uh, and you know, it was based on the hypothesis that if you reduce the traffic speed, you're gonna reduce the number of uh, uh, um, accidents and fatalities, right? And we do see that there is a positive relationship between collisions and speed, as well as the uh, person skilled and speed, right? Which indicates that the reduction in traffic speed is a good policy uh, that, you know, it's likely to uh, improve uh, these indicators, right? So, a, yes? A quick question. So what do you mean by positive relationship? Do you just mean that the, uh, the atypical events of collisions correspond with atypical events of traffic speed? Or exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, it's at very high traffic speeds leads to more collisions and more deaths. So what are the takeaways here? Uh, that's, uh, so I think one is that you know, it's, it's quite important you know, to guide the users in data exploration, right? And, and with data polygamy, the idea is uh, to do that by using data to explain data and hopefully help users gain trust in the data that they're analyzing, right? One word of caution is that um, you know, we're generating these relationships, right? But these relationships should, should be viewed at high, as hypotheses. These are not like a real answer to a problem. This is, you know, generating hypotheses that should be tested like people generally test hypotheses, right, to confirm whether they are true or not. So we can think of this as kind of like a search engine, right? You shouldn't take it at its face value. You should investigate whether that's true or not, right? And uh, we've actually been working on uh, variations of this approach using different data models, the different kinds of event detections, uh, looking at, you know, if you actually can explain, explain outliers, and this problem becomes very hard because when you have outliers, you have very few of them, and how do you show that that's uh, statistically significant, right? So this is work that uh, my student Alini Bessa has done and uh, hopefully is gonna appear at uh, ACM TDS soon, right? Um, and as I said, one of the applications uh, of, uh, you know, such a, a um, uh, framework is for data discovery and modeling to try and find relation data, uh, uh, related data, right? And the, our vision is that this should be an integral part of the up and coming search engines for uh, data, for structured data. And uh, we've actually been working on this in the context of the DARPA D3M uh, project, which has, you know, three different components. We've been working on three different components. One is uh, the automatic synthesis of ML pipelines. 
So the idea here is that you'd like domain experts to build the predictive models. And they come with uh, uh, data set, and they come with what they want to predict. And what we built is machinery that actually uses deep learning to generate pipelines that solve that problem and create a predictive model or a set of predictive models for uh, that particular problem. Right? Uh, and we're also building a visual analytics system that uh, allows the domain expert to inspect these models and try to understand, explain, understand how the models work and whether they do the job that, is, uh, that, that the expert actually uh, intends. And uh, the third part, which is related to this data set for uh, to search engine for data sets, is uh, the data augmentation part, right? Because machine learning models are as good as the data that you provide as input. And since data has been democratized, there's lots of data sets out there. So the question is, how can you find data sets that are likely to improve your machine learning models? Right? So as part of this project, we are building this search engine that has um, operations that are designed to help users discover data that improve their machine learning models. And uh, one of the operations is uh, you know, this query that I showed to you, finding uh, data sets that are related uh, based on the uh, atypical features. Uh, we also find data sets that join, and we actually use Raoul's uh, Lasso system. It's integrated in, in our search engine. Okay, so to conclude, um, you know, uh, I really believe that, uh, you know, urban data, the data itself and the requirements around them uh, open up many new opportunities that uh, can help us not only understand cities, but also uh, perform actions uh, and interventions that can actually improve cities and the lives of their residents. Uh, but to do that, we really need to make sure that uh, uh, domain experts, the real stakeholders, policymakers, uh, social scientists, and residents are actually able to obtain um, insights that are actionable and trustworthy. Right? Uh, and I mentioned to you a few projects that we've been uh, working on that uh, aim to attain this goal. Right? Uh, another big takeaway, I think, from all these years working on these problems is that you really need interdisciplinary teams. So I'm very happy to see efforts like CDAC uh, that tries to bring, you know, uh, to build these teams because they're really necessary to solve real problems. And this interdisciplinary here is, uh, you know, multidimensional. It's uh, both within computer science, different areas of computer science, and other domains uh, of science. And, this can create this very nice virtual cycle where, uh, you know, domain-specific problems lead to new research questions in computer science, which by solving those, you can actually lead to discoveries in the domain, right? So uh, I think that, you know, this can actually be a big boost, I think, for the whole scientific in endeavor. Uh, and I also strongly believe that, you know, these areas of data science, but not just data science, data engineering. Engineering is a huge component. Without engineering, you cannot solve these real problems, right? And but through data science and engineering, uh, we can actually have huge impact, uh, practical impact on many different applications, even beyond urban. With that, I close and uh, I thank my funders and thank you. Maybe we have time for a question. Yeah. Yes. So, so yeah. So one question I have is, um, you you commented on this, right? That uh, people should not take the output of these systems at face value, but rather as a hypothesis of what an answer could be for a given question and try to do the the, mm -hmm. the appropriate tests. Uh, but the truth is that in general, you know, the moment that you put tools out there, people will use them in any way they want. Uh, and so the question is, have you thought of what are the mechanisms that could be implemented as part of these tools to sort of prevent people from, you know, sort of assuming that that correlation means that something costs something, like a correlation versus causation kind of problem, mm -hmm. or uh, to avoid them for, for, you know, to suffer confirmation bias, these kind of uh, pitfalls that occur when people are analyzing data. Right. So I think that, 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 that there are different approaches to that, right? So one is... Uh, being explicit about it, and that's what we've been trying to do, right? right? Uh, I think another uh, aspect related to your question uh, is also, uh, when people are doing data analysis and exploration, can we actually alert them of potential pitfalls, right? right? 
Uh, so one related work that we've been doing in this area is in the area of debugging pipelines, these you know, different steps, right? Uh, uh, so in that case, what we are doing is we're actually trying to run the pipelines with different input data, varying, automatically varying the parameters and inputs, and looking at the results and seeing you know, what caused what, right? right? But this is more like in debugging the process as opposed to, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, the, these uh, more user-facing, if you will, like that polygamy is not, you know, um, doesn't give exact answers. Yeah, I think part of that also is going to be through education, Absolutely. and then this is, comes as the danger, right? So data has been democratized. We're democratizing data exploration now. Everybody thinks that they're going to be able to explore data, but then you know the mistakes are going to be democratized too. You can actually end up with a lot more bad stuff. So I think that this is a very important area that needs to be investigated by us in the computer science community. Yeah. Mike? We're a little bit low on time, so let Mike have the last, uh, last word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, let's thank Juliana. Yeah. All right, thank you.